Archon Angel Thomas up there has put me on live again. Thank you very much. I've entitled this one All at Sea. We've all been there, even though we might never have been to sea. <laughs> the Lord, this is the text, hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came, the ship threatened to break up. The sailors were afraid, and each cried to his God. That's the first thing they do. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone on, down into the hold. He lay down, and he was fast asleep. <laughs> the captain came. What are you doing? Sound asleep. Get up, call on your God. Perhaps... He will spare us a thought so that we don't perish. Jonah is now causing chaos. And I love it, the first response of each of the sailors is to cry to his God. And no doubt, I suppose, there were as many gods as there were sailors on the boat. The religious figure as often, is fast asleep. And you say, what is this sleep of Jonah? Is Jonah sleeping through a storm? The Greeks have a lovely word, skatosis, which means elected blindness. <laughs> when you don't want to pay attention to what's going on because it's so painful, you cut yourself off from the world that surrounds you. I think that's his deep, deep sleep. Think of the captain's theology. Perhaps you're God. The only person Jesus called Satan was Peter. Because Peter held strongly to what he thought. And Jesus said, the way that you think is not God's way. You have to allow room in your thinking for God's way. And this captain has that in his attitude. There's a perhaps God will spare her. Jonah doesn't pray. Why not? He's trying to escape from God, so he probably doesn't want to reopen communications. <laughs> <laughs> Shakespeare has wonderful advice in Macbeth um, merciful heaven what man ne'er pull your hat upon your brow becoming blind give sorrow words the grief that does not speak whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break give sorrow words. And in the book of Psalms, there is a wonderful category called lamentation, isn't there? Where the argument is that no matter what condition you're in, resentful, angry, jealous, you feel betrayed, put that into prayer, give sorrow words. I love the old man who says, look, do not neglect me now that I am old and grey-headed. I'm going to take up guitar lessons. And I will pray until dawn, but no, no, do not neglect me. Friend and neighbour, you have taken away from me. My one companion is darkness. Very little of our liturgy reflects the prayer of reality. Lamentation very rarely appears in our formal liturgies, does it? 
Lamentation usually appears in a community that's washing up. The sailors suspect that somebody on board is responsible for the chaos. So they decide to cast lots. So what you do is you get, put everybody's name on a small stone, right? You put all the stones in a griddle and you shake the griddle. Try this at a community meeting. <laughs> and the stone <laughs> that falls out that's the name of the one who is responsible. Now, the fascinating thing is, Jonah just watches this. What's he hoping? That somebody else's name will fall out so that the spotlight does not fall on him. But one stone falls out, and guess whose name is on it? <laughs> Jonah's. They said to him, these sailors are very polite. Can you, this is a great community meeting. Can you tell us why this calamity has come upon us since you arrived? <laughs> Try that one. <laughs> What's your occupation? What are you doing here? What's your country? Who are you? Where are you from? Jonah's great reply is, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, who is the God of the heavens and the earth and the sea. And the sailors become more afraid. The sailors focus on Jonah's identity. He doesn't tell them who he is. He doesn't tell them he's a prophet. He tells him he's a Hebrew. Now, if I said to you, I want to give you a big revelation, I am from Scotland, this would not be a big revelation. You might have guessed it already. And if you'd listened to the introduction, you would have known it. <laughs> he focuses on the God he believes in, and he terrifies them. And the ancient religions often, the sea was supposed to be the territory of the devil or the evil spirits, and gods essentially were gods of the land. In confessing that his god is the creator of the sea, the sailors read that Jonah's god is responsible for the storm. Eventually, Jonah becomes a good Catholic, and he goes to confession. Um, and I mean, up until now, he has claimed that he's innocent. John is dangerous because his decision, dear friends, was not a cloistered one, free of social consequences. He's caused decent people great distress. He's endangered the lives of innocent people. I love Graham Greene's quote from The Quiet American. He says, innocence always comes, calls mutely for protection. We would be much better to guard ourselves against it. Innocence is like a dumb leper who's lost his bell, wandering the world, meaning no harm. Jonah, the innocent one, is wandering the world, meaning no harm, and causing chaos everywhere. Dear friends, good people can cause chaos. You only have to live in community five minutes to discover that. <laughs> and Jonah learns this not through honest self-reflection, but because the sailors insist on it. And now Jonah realizes he's not an innocent. He's responsible for the whole tragedy. 
And they're, they're so polite. They say, what shall we do with you? That this turbulence may quiet down for us. Try that at a community meeting as well. And Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. And you say, Jonah, why don't you jump? <laughs> why will you not take responsibility for something in your life? Why involve a whole group of innocent people in your murder? And the men are so polite. They say no, and they row harder. And the harder they row, the worse the storm becomes. Poor old Jonah. All he has to do is repent. Think about it. He prefers death to repentance. His hunger for being right is so great. The fear of loss of face is so great that he's prepared to die. He gives himself a penance. Dear friends, a penance without repentance is just self-punishment. It's something to do. It's not going to change anything, is it? And I love these sailors. I mean, it's not in their job description to throw fee-paying passengers overboard. I would imagine even in those days it was against health and safety. <laughs> and then they pray. Who do they pray to now? They pray to Jonah's God. Think about this. Jonah has converted a ship. Not through his strength, but through his fragility. Dear friends, a lot of people are more attracted by fragility than they are by majesty, by vulnerability rather than strength. Which is summarized by that beautiful maxim applied to Jesus. It is by his wounds that we are healed. Not by his strength. Not by his miracles. Not by his great teaching. But by his wounds. And it's by the wounds of Jonah that these sailors are converted. They pray, please, O oh Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood. So they decide to throw Jonah overboard, but they're very afraid of the consequences. They no longer pray to their own gods to protect them. So they pick Jonah up by the hands and the legs. And it's one, two, <laughs> three, and it's bye bye, baby. And I love this. As soon as Jonah's body hits the water, all is calm again. This happens sometimes in communities, doesn't it? One person leaves, tranquility is, is restored. Sometimes the best gift a community can have is a new absence. Very realistic, the book of Jonah. The sailors now disappear from the narrative. A wonderful group of upstanding men who now pray to Jonah's God. The Lord 
does not allow Jonah his death wish. And you have this, this psychological imagery, I think is very profound. Jonah is dismissed into the depth. That's what he wants. He wants to disappear. He wants to die. And you watch this image going down into the deep. And Jonah, who is not famous for keeping his mouth shut, meets a great fish. <laughs> not famous for keeping its mouth shut. And of course, it's the Lord who provides the fish, it says, to swallow Jonah. And Jonah is in the fish for three days and three nights. This image, think about this image. I think the psychological image here is clear, dear friends. Jonah is exiled from land, from ship, and from people. He's taken out. And often when people are involved in totally destructive behavior, the only thing you can do is take them out. I love that image. He's in the depth, and he's out of his depth, isn't he? He's not yet at himself. Now, my beloved mum was a very gentle character from Donegal, and when she excused people, and she was always excusing people, she would say, ah, the poor soul's not at himself. And you say, well, he's here. It took us years to understand the meaning of that. That yourself can be something beyond you that you still have to journey to. And sometimes if you're lucky, like the phrase in the prodigal son, sometimes if you're lucky, you come to yourself. He has to face, before he passes onwards, he must first pass inwards. And that is a journey that he's been avoided. Sometimes it's easier to go to Heathrow Airport and fly to Nairobi than it is to go inwards. To consult yourself. Something in Jonah has to give, doesn't it? Something in Jonah has to die. And the challenge is for the prophet to reclaim his vocation and reconnect with God. He has to revisit the basic questions that haunt him. Who am I? Where am I going in my life? And what shapes the way that I look at life? God sends Jonah on retreat in wet conditions <laughs> for three days. There are no distractions. Jonah has to recollect himself. And I mean that literally. He has to collect himself again. As periodically we all have to do when we get a wee bit lost. He has the opportunity now to repent. The great challenge and then, God help us, he starts to pray for the first time in the story, Jonah prays. There's probably not much else to do in the whale retreat center. <laughs> I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. You cast me into the deep. You say, excuse me, Jonah. Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> In his prayer, 
Jonah is pleased to rewrite his story blaming God that it was God who cast him into the deep into the heart of the sea and everything else all your waves passed over me he's become an amnesiac already but the good thing is the good thing is he ends his prayer with a promise that the vows he has made to the Lord he will fulfill. He promises he will be the prophet of the Lord. He promises that he will go to Nineveh. And his last prayer, his last sentence is deliverance belongs to the Lord. which is a great theme of Pope Francis. But Jonah is going to object to that because he believes deliverance should belong to him. Then the Lord spoke to the fish. Jonah, dear friends, worshipped false idols. His self-image, his reputation, He abandoned his true royalty to God. And like the prodigal son, he now comes to himself. He says he will be who he claims to be. He will go where he is commanded to go. He will allow the word of God to shape his life. And when he makes that decision, the whale has an ecumenical movement. And Jonah is deposited on the land again, to begin again. You know the first stanza of that famous Hound of Heaven. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the mist of tears, I hid from him. And when he's vomited onto the land, the word of God comes to Jonah a second time. Get up. Often God seems to speak in telegrams, or we would say he's very good at text messaging. <laughs> Get up. Go. Go. Speak my word. <laughs> I love this. Jonah is the only prophet in the Old Testament who needs to be called twice. Dear friends, he has a brother in the New Testament who needed to be called twice. You remember his name. His name was Simon Bar-Jonah. Simon, the son of Jonah. Because he too became a runaway. When a little girl found him lying in the dark at the high priest's palace which is a warning to all religious authorities not to take themselves too seriously. And in all four Gospels that story is told. And just like Jonah, it is not just Peter's faith, it's his fragility that is part of the Gospel. It's not just his loyalty that's part of the Gospel, it's his disloyalty. After the priest reads the denial of Peter, the priest will say, this is the good news of the Lord. And somebody might well say, I must have missed something. <laughs> but that's it about Jonah and Simon bar Jonah. Their fragility is at the heart of the story. 
and the purpose of not denying that fragility is to give hope. Remember the beautiful prayer of Jesus in Luke's Gospel. Simon, I have prayed for you. The devil has got his wish to sift you all like wheat, but I have prayed for you that once you have recovered, you will come back and strengthen the community. Luke has a profound theology of failure. But failure can be a teacher. Jonah is a failure. But he too becomes our teacher through his failings. And with that pious thought, I will leave you to come back at what time, Father Peter? Two o'clock. You have time for an excellent lunch and a snooze. <laughs> <laughs> now, just before you go, just before you go, Margaret here, Vocation Island, would like a couple of words with you. Thank you. <laughs> Margaret.